This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is with you. We are glad you're here. A special warm welcome to our visitors and our guests here and online. We hope you find this a welcoming place in the name of Christ. And I invite all of you to sign and pass the ritual friendship pads. It should be at the end of your pew. And maybe greet those on your aisle when the passing of the peace comes. After worship, we'll gather in the fellowship hall for some, uh, well, no, in the gathering space for some goodies. So I hope you'll come and be a part of that. Uh, so uh, a couple of announcements for you. Uh, first of all, after the fellowship time, you're invited to our uh, 11 o'clock class that we will continue looking at God's gifts to us, the way we are gifted in Christ. And today we're going to look at an unusual set of gifts in 1 Corinthians 14 about uh, speaking in tongues and healing and all that kind of thing. So I hope you'll come and be a part of that. We appreciate that very much. You, we still need some volunteers. There's Maggie. Raise your hand, Maggie. If you're ready to hear the call to help with our children during worship, Maggie's the person to talk to. So thank you very much. Also, uh, Monday, I think, is uh, Laundry Love. Is that correct? Yes. So if you want to know more about that, uh, talk to Lori or, 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 or whomever. Yeah. There's Lori. Talk to Lori right afterwards. <laughs> also, you deacons, remember you have a meeting on Monday morning and Friday the women's Bible study will gather. And then Saturday, the men's uh, study group that gathers on Saturday mornings at 7.45 is starting a new book on March 16th, and it's a marvelous book by Richard Rohr, who's part of our community, uh, entitled Falling Upward. And if you want to hear more about that, Steve, where are you? Over here. Where, where's Steve? Oh, there. Talk to Steve. <laughs> Very good. Uh, friends in Christ, you are gathered in the worship of God, and today is Communion Sunday. And remember that this is an open table, that all who trust Jesus are invited to this table. This is Christ's table, and you are welcome. So remember, Sarah, by the way, I was going to tell you, is on vacation. She'll be back in the office on Monday. Remember her in prayer as she travels back. So friends in Christ, let us gather our hearts and minds in the worship of the living God. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament claims that God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and declares knowledge. So let us bring our praise and thanksgiving to God who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Our opening hymn is number 637, O Sing to the Lord.
may be seated. With humility of heart, we bring our confession to the Lord of mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers and grant us your peace. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be. And we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, our Lenten journey takes us back where we began, where we were baptized into Christ Jesus. There we died, and we were raised to a new life. Here at this baptismal font, you hear the most important words that you will ever hear in your life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Friends in Christ, now let us join together in the passing of the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us join together. would join us in singing the praise song, saying how great is our God.
last, and the last will be first. Jesus looks in the heart. Jesus looks at God at the back of the line. It's probably the person that's down. He's surprised at your grace and your mercy and your kindness. Before we turn to scripture, I want to acknowledge these beautiful flowers in, in remembrance of uh, Virginia Helms, a dear sister in this congregation who uh, passed from us uh, about a year ago. And also I want to welcome Carl Boaz to celebrate the Eucharist with me at the table. It's always a pleasure to have you, Carl. Friends in Christ, let's turn to one of the most counterintuitive and paradoxical pieces of scripture 
in all the New Testament, where here Paul turns everything upside down. And he, in his own way, says, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So listen now for the word of God from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those to whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. During the Christmas break of 1972, I went with my parents to the Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. There I saw, for the first time, the musical Godspell. Not sure which was more memorable, the theater where Lincoln was assassinated or that brand new musical about Jesus. Together, the theater and the play made for a truly unforgettable evening. Now, when the actors came on stage in their circus-like garb singing those wonderfully catchy songs, I was simply delighted. In truth, this musical has been delighting audiences ever since, and maybe it has delighted you. But my dad was not amused. <laughs> After the opening scene, my dad exited the theater and sat in the lobby for the rest of the performance. And afterwards, I asked him why, and he replied curtly, Jesus is no clown. Neither the makeup nor the clown costumes were charming one bit to him. And in his defense, of others have felt the same way. Either you love God's spell or you just don't get it. That same year, I read Harvey Koch's famous book, The Feast of Fools. Cox called upon the church to see Jesus as a kind of harlequin, a personification of festivity and fantasy to an age that had lost both. And Cox sketches the history of seeing Jesus as a clown figure going all the way back to the earliest Christians in Rome. Early catacomb artists depicted a crucified human figure but who had the head of an ass. That strange figure, according to Cox, represents in a deeper sense the comic absurdity of their position as Christians. A wretched band of slaves, derelicts, and square pegs. These Christians must have sensed how ludicrous their claims about Jesus appeared to outsiders especially very powerful Romans. Listen to Cox's description of Jesus that is so reminiscent of God's spell. Like the jester, Jesus defies custom and scorns crowned heads. Like a wandering troubadour, he has no place to lay his head. Like a minstrel, he frequents dinners and parties thrown by the most unlikely of hosts. And like a clown in a circus parade, he satirizes existing authority 
by riding into town with regal authority when he has no power whatsoever. And at the end, at the end of his life, he is costumed by his enemies in a mocking caricature of royal paraphernalia, replete with a crown of thorns. He is crucified amidst taunts with a sign over his head that mocks his laughable claim to power. A king, a king indeed. Well, Paul agrees that there is a kind of divine foolishness about our convictions regarding Jesus. What we say about Jesus and his execution is this. Think about it. What a profound claim and an absurd claim at the same time. A crucified criminal is the savior of the world. Think about that. What an audacious claim. And he acknowledges it. He says this, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Christ crucified is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Now, a stumbling block means a scandal. And foolishness, literally in the Greek, means moronic. It is the kind of claim that makes people laugh. It's the kind of claim that makes you exit for the lobby since it seems all so ludicrous. Some just don't get it. And some don't want to get it. The cross really should be always a stumbling block and a matter of foolishness, at least to those who will not see it. For Paul, this resistance must be faced. It is much more profound than the resistance to a theatrical portrayal of Jesus as a clown-like figure. It is in truth, according to, to Paul, a deep resistance to the very wisdom of God, the wisdom that undermines all of our street smarts, a divine wisdom that laughs at all of our clever strategies to get ahead and succeed, a kind of divine wisdom that makes us rethink what the word clever really means. Paul claims this, and listen, God made foolish the wisdom of the world. And did he quotes from the Hebrew scriptures which suggests that God will, are you ready for this verb, destroy the wisdom of the wise. God chooses what is utterly foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak and despised to reduce to things that are to nothing. All that boastful arrogance that pretends to know the inside story is exposed as just mere hot air. Before God and the cross, the wisdom of the world actually looks rather empty indeed. But Christ crucified, now there, there's the wisdom of God. Who could have imagined such a thing? Divine foolishness, which is also divine wisdom. Wisdom that humbles all of us before the absurdity of the cross. Wisdom that lifts up the needy and the poor and the distressed. Wisdom that gives life that is life indeed. The vulnerable suffering Christ is in truth God's most profound act of wisdom. The cross is God's way of humbling us and granting us reconciliation. It's an amazing statement we gather around every Sunday. Now, Frederick Beekner delivered the Lyman Beekner lectures at Yale Divinity School in 1977. He entitled his book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale. And he suggested that the main difference between tragedy and comedy is this. Tragedy is the expected, while comedy is the unexpected. While tragedy confirms our worst suspicions, comedy 
surprises us, even startles us. And I think that there's something about the cross of Jesus that is a kind of divine comedy, as Dante called it. God does what is totally unexpected. The all-powerful God becomes subject and a vulnerable victim. The one who rules the universe allows himself to be slaughtered by a petty tyrant. This is precisely what we never expected from God. God's wisdom displayed is a kind of nonsense that caused people at the foot of the cross to taunt him to his very dying breath. And so we laugh. We laugh with God and at ourselves for expecting something else. We marvel at this wondrous God who surprises us in the deepest way possible, suffering what we suffer, dying as we die, and living to tell us what it all meant, that this was the path for reconciliation and forgiveness. Who could have guessed such a thing? But it's God's way of capturing our hearts and melting our pride and bringing us to our knees. Who saw this coming? So, if you would like to follow Jesus, then I invite you, in Paul's words, to become a fool for Christ's sake. I invite you to do that. Seemingly foolish people who love the things Jesus loved serve those Jesus served, and give ourselves to those whom Jesus expended it all for. When we take up his mantle, it all looks so very, very foolish. Why? Because our hearts are moved to care about the least of these, the forgotten and the abused. And it may seem like a fool's errand, that we're called to undertake. And nevertheless, I invite us this Lent to follow this troubadour, this minstrel, this jester, to places only he could take us. We follow him into a kind of divine foolishness that alone is redemptive and saving. There we find life and life eternal. What fools we seem to be to the world. And yet, I invite us to gladly bear that name. Fools for Christ's sake. So my fellow fools, come to this table of reconciliation and meet again this surprising God who says yes to you with all of your needs. Taste and see that the Lord is good, and learn what it is to rejoice again, to love again, to celebrate again, to give thanks again for life abundant, life forevermore. You are invited to this unexpected banquet of love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our communion hymn in remembrance of me.
with grateful hearts to this surprising God, let us give our lives, our time, our talent, and our treasure. unexpected love that comes to us in the most surprising of places. And God, give us the grace to give our lives for you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As Frank told us earlier, Christ is the owner of this table. And we are invited to come and share in this communion with him. And we come to this table not because we must, but because we may, and we're invited, and it is not something that we really choose on our own. We come to this table not because we're strong, but because we're weak. We come not because of any goodness on our own part, but because we need mercy and help. We come because we love the Lord and would like to love him more. We come because he loves us and gave himself for us. And we come and meet the risen Christ together, for we are his body. Please join me in prayer. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And we do give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, for how great is your love and how wonderful is your name. You created this world, and in it you called it good for us. You provide all we need to live. You call us to be your people, and you lead us as a flock. You turn tears into laughter and fill us with good things. And when we lose our way, you send prophets to call us home. So in hope we sing your praise because you are holy, as well as being full of grace and compassion. We give you thanks that you sent Jesus to be born and live among us as a gift of your love and grace. We confess that We've often rejected him, and we know we are complicit in allowing him to be crucified. And yet we rejoice that his death was not the end, and that his resurrection brings a whole new creation. And so, with great thanksgiving, O Lord, we remember your love for all people revealed in Jesus Christ. And as we come to this table, 
we offer ourselves in your service from this day to the end of the age. So pour out your Holy Spirit, O Lord, upon these gifts of bread and wine, and upon us as your people, that together we may truly be the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please empower us by your Holy Spirit to live as one people in the world, and help us to live in peace and joy with sisters and brothers, loving each other as Christ loves until he comes again. And we offer the prayer Jesus taught us, Padre Nuestro. Que estas en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre, venga tu reino, sea hecha tu voluntad, como en el cielo, así también en la tierra. El pan nuestro de cada día, danos hoy, y perdona nuestros deudas, como también nosotros perdonamos a nuestros deudas, y no nos dejes caer en tentación, mas libranos de paz, porque tú y yo es el reino, el poder y la gloria por todos los siglos. Amén. As the scriptures tell us, Jesus met on the night he was betrayed with his disciples. And when they gathered, he took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it and said, This bread is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup, the cup of blessing, and said, This cup is the new covenant which is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink, all of you. And every time you drink of this cup, do so, remembering me. Brothers and sisters, every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom belongs glory honor and praise now and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. In a moment, our servers will come down, and you may come down the middle aisle, if you will, and Carl will have the gluten-free bread for you, and, and there will be bread and wine on, the, on each side. Brothers and sisters, come now, for all is ready.
Sisters and brothers, let us join together in our prayer. Eternal God, as you feed your people in the wilderness with unexpected food, so you feed us at this table with a simple loaf and cup. Here you transform us by the working of your wondrous love. Now send us out to be Christ's body in your broken and beautiful world, to hear your good news of hope and joy for all. Amen. Now our last hymn is a very festive hymn, what a minstrel and a troubadour would sing. Let us stand and sing. I get reconverted when I think about the cross, when I focus on what Christ did for us. Then my heart is strangely warmed, and I am back in the fold. And may that be so for you. 
May the cross lift up your heart and guide you and give you good hopes, knowing that in Christ we are raised with him to rule with him someday. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit attend you and inspire you now and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Hey, April.